Pushkin. Todd Rundgren is a multi-talented musician who has made a name for himself both as a solo artist and a visionary music producer. Rundgren's career started in Philly in the mid-60s as part of the garage rock band The Naz. After playing lead guitar in the band for two years, Rundgren left to pursue a solo career and over the next two decades worked as a producer for bands like Grand Funk Railroad, Badfinger, and the New York Dolls. But Rundgren's crowning achievement was producing Meatloaf's Bat Out of Hell album, which is to this day one of the highest selling albums of all time. But now Rundgren lives far away from the spotlight in Hawaii. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this past October, but skipped out on the ceremony to play a local club down the street instead. He also spent many months recording vocals for Kanye's Donda, but eventually bowed out of that as well. He is busy working on an album of his own, however, a collaborative project called Space Force with artists like Sparks, Rivers Cuomo, and Ben Folds that'll be out later this year. On today's episode, we'll hear a conversation Rick Rubin had with Rundgren just weeks before the start of the pandemic. They talk about why he was the only producer who would work on the debut album for Meatloaf, who just recently passed away. Todd also talks about engineering the third album for the band when the group was in the midst of turmoil and why he always turns off Taylor Swift's music. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Rick Rubin and Todd Rundgren. What's been going on? I'm in the middle of doing another collab record, so... Just in the last two weeks, I got stuff from Sparks, oh, cool. Adrian Ballou. Great. This new band that I've done a little work with called the Lemon Twigs. Ben Folds sent me like 10 things, and I got to pick one to focus on. How long have you been doing collaborations like this? Well, my last album was pretty much, you know, it was mostly all collaborations. Some songs by myself, but I made a conscious decision because I've been making all my records out here. I make them by myself, you know, in my own echo chamber. So I thought I'm get some more influence in here, do some audience expansion. Does it always start by them sending you something? It was all different. At least the last time it was different, different methods. Like for instance, Robin, I thought I'll, you know, maybe I can get Robin to do this song. I think she writes, but I just sent her the song, said, you're interested. And she said, yeah, I like the song. I'll do the song. Great. So in that particular instance, it was simply like I did the whole recording and she did the vocals on it. Then there were ones in which somebody would send me something like Joe Walsh sent me a track that it's almost always like something that they were working on that went moribund, you know. So you get excited at the beginning, and then somewhere in the middle of the process, you kind of you either move on to something else or you lose interest in it. So a lot of people have these half-finished things laying around, and those are actually the most fun for me because it's their idea, but it's still room for me to do something with it. You know, because it's not completely finished. Even that can take different sort of turns. Like Ben Fold sent me about a dozen versions of a song that he does live, which turns out to be different every single night. It's called like Rock This Bitch or something like that. Uh, It just turned out to be a gag that he does in all of his shows. And then he makes a song up on the spot. But somewhere, and they say, we're going to rock this bitch in Norfolk tonight, you know, (laughs) or something like that. So he said, all I've got to do is, like, find one, get rid of the rock this bitch part, you know, (laughs) figure out something else about, you know, what it's about, and we'll have a song somehow. But it's, you know, it's not the same as doing your own record, because I have control over the timeline. When you start involving other artists it's harder to make demands and say finish this now because my record label wants to release it only certain artists are first of all willing to collaborate and then sometimes there are conflicting schedules like i think i'm doing something with thomas dolby and before he couldn't do it because he was too busy doing something else but now he's got a window so he didn't uh, do anything for the first record but we may get something done for this one That's actually an interesting idea. Instead of them always being different artists, really having a distant band, you and one other artist. Yeah, it's hard to find artists that are fully comfortable with this process. Mm -hmm. Even a lot of the people that I assume, you know, have the technical 
wherewithal to do things like runoff stems and stuff like that. You often find that they depend on an engineer to do, you know, to keep track of where stuff is and to run stuff off. That's an extra layer that you have to go through. So ideally you find an artist who is as experienced with the stuff as you are and you're just like, take what you give them, turn it around, send it back. In that sense, I can clear up all, any issues on my end yeah. by myself because I can engineer. But maybe there's someone you can cast in that role who you really like, you know, someone whose music you love where it would feel like fun to do that all. Well, it's funny there, you know, that there's a lot of music out there. Like for instance, Trent Reznor on the last record, he sent me a whole album's worth of stuff because he and Atticus Ross do a lot of film and TV soundtrack work. And so they just archive stuff. They'll come up with an idea, something that would be a mood for a film, and then they archive it. So when I asked him if he had anything, he sent me like almost two dozen wow. of these various themes, you know, and said, pick one. None of them had any lyrics or anything on them. So. Yeah, it's funny. The last record, there was only one what you would consider traditional collaboration, and that was just a coincidence. I was pretty much done the record, and I had this one orphan track, and I didn't know what to do with it, and I was just going to leave it. And Donald Fagan was on the island, and we were out to dinner, and I said, well, I got this orphan track, you know, about to deliver my record. You want to listen to it? He said, sure. And I thought it was a Steely Danish kind of thing anyway, a little bit jazzy. So I sent it to him. And the next day he just starts sending back titles, you know, song titles. Some of them are just like out of the blue and ridiculous. But we sent back one and said, tinfoil hat. And then we suddenly knew that's what we have to do. I had the track pretty much all recorded, but we wrote the song together in the way that you would think Paul McCartney and John Lennon would. Moon, spoon. June, <laughs> you know, tune. <laughs> so uh, that was the only time that I was physically in the same place as my collaborator, which was fun. But I've had episodes where I was supposed to like write with someone. And I'm not usually not very good at just, you know, sitting down and writing with someone. I had known Donald for a long time, so I think we were a little bit more simpatico than if I was meeting someone for the first time and supposed to write with him. But I remember, you know, an episode with like Rick Springfield, who came to my house when I was living in Sausalito, wanting to write something. And all we did was just kind of sit there and look at each other, you know, because for me, in some ways, writing is a, just a very personal thing. I usually try and find solitude when I have to write so that I'm not distracted by anything and I can eventually hear what I'm thinking in the back of my head. Making music is the way I learn about myself and make changes in myself because I objectivize ideas. And once they're out there, you can say, oh, that was stupid or, OK, that's not so bad. Stick with that. Where do you think the ideas come from? Well, sometimes they just come from the process. Like the most financially rewarding song I ever recorded was Bang the Drum All Day. But that was a song I dreamed because I was in the middle of making a record. When it was time to make a record, I would go back to my house in Lake Hill where I'd be completely alone with no distractions. And two weeks later, I'd have a record, you know, because... You remove all the distractions and suddenly you're thinking about music all the time and the process just starts to set in. My brain starts writing songs when I'm asleep, but it doesn't write the songs that I would write if I was conscious. I would never have thought of, let alone written a song so dumb as bang the drum all day. Yeah. In that sense, it was a gift from my subconscious saying, you won't understand why you're doing this now, yeah. but years from now, you will understand why you're doing this. Years from now is when we started getting Carnival Cruise Line deals. You know? How's your relationship to music changed over the course of your life? Everybody's relationship to music has changed. You know, my story is not any different than anyone else's. It's just I had the advantage of seeing it coming in the way that many artists didn't because of my other interests, my interest in computer technology and media in general. And I sort of knew that at one point, music was no longer going to be a commodity, that it was going to go back to being a service because it always was a service. 
and that we went through this entire illusory period when we figured out how to capture sound. We started selling the artifacts that held the sound on them and started to think that was music. You know, music is measured by the number of these things that you sell. But for the entire history of music up until that point, the only way you got paid as a musician, you performed. Unless you had the talent of a transcriptionist. A lot of the famous composers actually did, didn't make money off of writing the music they made. They re- made money off of writing it down. Wow. Making copies of it. This is the roots of music publishing. All of our recorded music publishing paradigms came from printed music. And before there was printed music, because there were not always printers to print the music, there were people who manually transcribed the music, and that was how they made a living. And then they wrote symphonies. Unless you're a vinyl freak or something, you don't think about music as this thing anymore. You don't even think about albums anymore, unless you just think about songs and playlists and podcasts and that sort of thing. What we call the quality time listening experience is no longer part of the average person's life. When I was growing up, there was no such thing as portable music. There was the music that you heard on the radio, but the DJ decided what that was. If you wanted a personal listening experience, you had to go home and sit in the sweet spot. And once you made the trouble for that, well, the Beatles just released Revolver, locked the door, unplug the phone do not interrupt me i'm going to sit here and i'm going to listen to it probably three times in a row the sony walkman essentially blew all that away because now the music becomes the soundtrack to your life and you have the option of deciding what it is wherever you happen to be and while it now services you in all of these other ways that it didn't before, like when you're jogging or when you're in the subway reading your newspaper and stuff like that, you're not in the music anymore. Don't pretend you're listening to the music in the way you would if you like shut down all your other senses. A little bit of a sidetrack, but it's based on what you just said. And I'm just picturing you as a kid and one of the Beatles albums comes out, it's a big deal. And the experience of listening to them those first times Can you remember how different it was each time? I do remember that eventually you got to realize that the Beatles were an evolutionary phenomenon, that it wasn't going to be love me do for 10 years or something like that. And I think that started to dawn on me, at least around Rubber Soul. Yeah. Because then they started incorporating other instruments, but more than just other instruments, other sorts of moods and textures. It was their most acoustic record up until that point, and yet it didn't flag in terms of the songwriting. The songwriting was evolving and getting into areas that weren't just about relationships with girls and and things like that. Yeah, you realize that, that you could grow to expect that there would be something different every record. Did they ever disappoint you? There are always little disappointments. There are always throwaway songs. And I'm pretty sure the Beatles knew there were throwaway songs in their catalogs. I know that when the Beatles first came out, I had to know every song. I had to know the guitar solo to every song. But I did not get Sgt. Pepper when it first came out. Did it come around for you eventually or no? Not in the way that most people did. Because one of the reasons why I didn't get it was I was like squeaky clean. Didn't take any drugs of any kind. I didn't drink. And the word was that you had to be on acid to fully appreciate this record. And I said, well, then I guess I'm just not getting this record because I'm not going to take the acid just to appreciate the record. If I can't appreciate the record without the acid, you know, then there must be something wrong with the record. Later, I actually got into it more for the sound of it. Mm Mm-hmm because it was a different sound than their previous records. The previous records all mostly were pretty dry and they didn't use a lot of ambience or anything like that. Certainly didn't use a full symphony orchestra or anything. And so it was more the sound and a certain way that the voices were placed that gave them that separation that your psychedelic mind would have given it. In other words, I think the Beatles were influencing George Martin in some ways, you know, in terms of how they wanted the record to sound. How did you connect with Albert Grossman? The choices that I made later in life were affected by what happened to me very early on when I formed my first band. I 
got out of high school and I got into a local blues band, which made me something of a celebrity in downtown Philadelphia. So when that band decided that they wanted to be the Grateful Dead and go to the country and drop acid and that sort of thing. I said, okay, I'm done with that. I'm going to start my own band. And I had enough of a name at that point that I could just steal people from any other band. And we had a quartet called the Naz. We did cover songs like everybody did at first because I had yet to write any material. I started writing songs and the first song I ever wrote was Hello, It's Me. Then I got whisked away from Philadelphia to New York. Our manager was originally a publicist, so he knew everyone who edited the teen magazines. So before we were even signed, we were on the cover of 16 magazine as some new discovery. We were experiencing it as if we had already done it, but we hadn't done anything yet. We hadn't even gotten signed yet. But our manager knew how to publicize it. Anytime there was a big event in New York City that everyone had to be at, he would get us invited and get us a limousine. And we would show up at that event and everyone would say, who are those guys? (laughs) And so eventually we got signed to a really big contract. Wow, it's amazing. Two albums later, band is done. It's all done. And after that, I started to learn about what the engineer does because after mixing the second NAS record, And having a free run of the console, I'm just starting to absorb all of the basic engineering concepts. And after the second record, the band blew up and I'm on the street. And the partner of the guy who managed the NAS, about six months later, finds me spending my days uh, doing lights in a discotheque, designing lights for a disco, doing nothing at all to do with music, hanging out with clothiers in the West Village. And he says, I'm working for Albert Grossman now, and he's tasked me with finding new young talent. I saw how you worked on the last two records. We need someone to come in and modernize a lot of the old legacy artists. Because Albert Grossman, he was no longer managing Bob Dylan, but that was how he got famous. Bob Dylan, Peter, Paul, and Mary. He was managing James Cotton, and then eventually he did uh, Janis Joplin. So he was like, you know, the world's most high-powered manager at that point. One of the very first things they did was put me on a Jesse Winchester project. They asked me if I would engineer, thinking that I had more experience as an engineer than I actually had. But they liked what I did. I was really quick. I had learned a lot of things about mic placement during the second Nas album. And so after that was done, they asked me to engineer Stage Fright, which was the first, you know, really big high profile gig that I had. And there were no producers on Stage Fright. It was like anybody who showed up was a producer. Is that the band's third album? It was the third one. Yeah, there was Big Pink, and then there was the brown one that had Cripple Creek on it, Mm -hmm. and then there was Stage Fright. And that was a real trial by fire. (laughs) Not simply because it was the first major product that I did, but the band was in this state of... I don't know whether to characterize it as turmoil, but... Were they still working with Bob at the time or no more? uh, They weren't working with Bob, no. But there were issues that were starting to fester. Some of them had to do with the band's sudden success. This is a bunch of musicians who for years and years and years, you know, all they were was a backup band for Ronnie Hawks, a Canadian who rarely toured in the United States, you know. And then suddenly they're thrust into the spotlight by playing with Bob Dylan. And then their first album comes out, and it's a big phenomenon. Second album comes out. By the time Stage Fright comes out, they're probably the biggest band in the world at this point yeah and maybe most influential as well as popular yeah because i mean it's like elton john puts out a song called leva you know how obvious can that be you know and it sounds just you know it's got all of those sort of earmarks of what the band is essentially i'd like to say fabricating you know because you listen to the band's record and you think oh these guys are all from arkansas No, they're all from Canada. The only one from Arkansas is Levon, and everything else is fabricated. You know, Robbie, who's writing all the material, is essentially pretending to be Levon. Yeah. In some ways, that might even make it better. You know, sometimes sometimes the distance, the fantasy, mm -hmm. makes it more... um, 
thrilling for the for the writer. They're not just yes. being themselves. They have an idealized version of this thing. But here's the reason why the band is in turmoil. Because Robbie's writing all the material and not sharing the publishing with anyone else in the band. And they're getting, they're starting to realize this by the third album. I mean, they haven't put out albums of their own before, so they don't know what publishing is. And then they get to the third album, and they realize that he's becoming a millionaire, and they're not sharing in any of that. Because not only are the third songs appearing on their records, people are covering the songs and having hit records with those songs. And so turmoil is starting to happen in the band. There's that. There's, uh, there's also the fact that after years and years and years of just being a band and, you know, out of the limelight and doing this, suddenly these guys are in the limelight, publishing aside, they have more money than they've ever had before, and making some of the guys a little crazy. They are doing things that they never did did before they are taking drugs in quantities that they've never had available before and drinking more than they ever had before and that sort of thing and so getting through the record was something of an exercise as well because they're all dealing with critical personal issues while the whole record is going on then to complicate even things even further they have promised glenn johns that he will have a chance to make the mix the record <laughs> so so they realize you know that they can't ask me to engineer the whole thing and then not mix it so they send me to england with all the master tapes we split them in half Glenn takes them somewhere and mixes them. And then they put me in a, stu they just booked me in a studio that, you know, because I don't know many studios in England at this point. Where was I? Uh <laughs> You're up to mixing the album. Oh, yeah, we're mixing the album. But uh, even, oh, uh, yeah, I'm but in England. But even go back a little further, though. You talk about making the album. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the what it was like to be in the studio with the band at that time. I understand there were, there were internal problems going on. Well, we weren't in the studio. We recorded most all of the album, the basic tracks. We recorded on the stage of the Woodstock Theater. Was that by their choice? They, there was no Bearsville Studios yet. And it was somewhat by their choice because they didn't want to record in a New York studio. I guess that's where they had done, I don't know what studios they had used before, but there were no studios comparable in, in Woodstock and the Woodstock area. So, But the studio was under construction. It was not built yet, not fully built yet. But they had bought a, uh, a remote truck, and so we took all of the equipment out of the remote truck and put it in the prop tent behind the Woodstock Theater. It was an outdoor theater? A summer stock theater. Uh. It was indoors, but not heated <laughs> or anything like that. So it would be sweltering hot in the daytime in the prop tent and freezing cold at night. And the sessions were just kind of had something of a stream of consciousness quality about them were the songs written before the before the songs are written and rehearsed before the sessions you know i had worked on the jesse winchester record and various people had made contributions to that but it wasn't like the whole band doing band material anything like that they were kind of subjugated to whatever was good for jesse winchester but you know they are very different guys and you know they were five very different guys and each with a certain kind of you know personality robbie was squeaky clean quite obviously in charge of everything running you know running the show writing everything sober as a monk you know that kind of thing there was garth garth never as far as i know you know did any kind of drugs he was not i don't think i ever saw him drinking anything but Garth had narcolepsy, you know, he would just drop off in the middle of the session. And I didn't know this. Nobody told me this, you know, so I'm kind of like, what's going on here, you know, and making wisecracks and they're getting angry with me because I don't know that he has narcolepsy. Rick was pretty dependable. Rick during the sessions would, you know, would be pretty dependable, but Rick had his own issues that might uh, take over in other contexts and ultimately did. Richard had a, a drinking issue, and I don't think it affected too much the session. But as I say, the, the session would be hours and hours of getting ready and then maybe two takes. And then a bunch of noodling around, and then maybe another 
another two takes. I'm not sure that any song went beyond eight takes just because the amount of futzing around that went on in between takes of like getting in the mood to do another take, which is not that unusual. I mean, a lot of bands are like that. You know, I remember going to a Rolling Stones rehearsal, which they call at around midnight and nobody makes a sound till 4 a.m. So <laughs> it's, you know, not that unusual, but sometimes it would be like, okay, we're an hour into the session and Richard hasn't shown up yet. Well, what do you think's going on? Finally, we get a call. Somebody found Richard with his car nose down in a culvert and he's been there all night. <laughs> you know, okay, we're ready to do a take. We saw uh, Levon was here, but where's Levon? We can't find him. We spent an hour looking for Levon. Levon is passed out under a pile of curtains because he has, you know, done a little bit too much of something during the session you know and just fell right asleep so it was you know a kind of a thing like a celestial alignment you know you have to get all the planets to line up for everything to come together and that for me young whippersnapper who ultimately like makes records in a matter of days not weeks and months you know it was a bit much for me and uh, every once in a while, I had to be, you know, slapped down. How long did the recording take? Tracking? Well, there were, you know, there were the the sessions, which I don't think we took much more than two weeks to do the basic sessions, but that wasn't the end of it. We had one or two other songs to do, which we had to do in a studio in New York because they had finally finished the control room of Studio B at Bearsville, and they were moving all the equipment into there. So we did like W.S. Walcott Medicine Show, I think was in a session in New York City. And those sessions turned out to be actually very productive, you know, because people weren't at home. They were away from home. They were in New York City. Sometimes in order to get that authentically kind of old timey sound, you know, they would. Well, for instance, I played the baritone horn on that song, and I had never played baritone horn in my life. But all I had to do was squeak out enough notes, you know, to make it sound like an authentic, authentic rinky-dinky weird band kind of thing. It was my lack of experience with the instrument that was necessary for it to sound authentic. And so, you know, there'd be the, like moments of that, you know, where it's like, if you do it too well, it doesn't work. You know, it has to have this sort of authentically kind of creaky, slightly sloppy aspect about it. Then there was the whole mixing episode, you know, with Glenn doing some and then me doing some. And ultimately I came back with the mixes, his and mine. And they weren't fully satisfied with either. So we started all over again in Studio B, a brand new Studio B, which nobody really knew what it sounded like. But we put our faith in John Stork. And uh, and then it was just, you know, the, the worst kind of experience for me, which I have, you know, which I have resolved ever since, you know, in any sort of production. Don't have the whole band in the room when you're building a mix. Because people only hear themselves. You know, the drummer only hears the drums. The guitar player only hears the guitar. You know, especially when you're building a mix, you know. And one of the worst was when I was mixing the New York Dolls' first album. It was compounded by the fact that they were in a hurry because they had to go to a gig. But it's one of these things where they're just like, no, nobody hears the whole mix. They only hear themselves. And everybody and you wants look to be louder. Cord, and all the faders are pinned at the top. Yeah. And you have to start all over again, yeah, you yeah. know. And so, you know, my modus operandi now is to like, go away. Yes. I will build a mix. Yes. Then you come back and tell me what you want different yes. about it. You know, but don't allow them there for the process. Unfortunately, they'd be there for the whole mix and it would just take forever, you know, and everyone would have an opinion, you know, so. And it wouldn't make it better. And it wouldn't necessarily make it better. Yeah. No, it would, might take weeks, you know, and often that kind of like dwelling on it makes it worse, which is why Andy Partridge hated XTC when it was first completed. Because I wouldn't allow that to happen. I wouldn't allow that anal business to ruin the record. 
you know, it was the first thing I did. I said, you're not listening to the mix. I'm going to build the mix. Then you come over and listen to the mix. By the time I was done the third one, they said, we're going home. <laughs> Either because they hated that aspect of the process, even though they liked the mixes, yeah. or because they trusted me. Yeah, I didn't one or the other. But uh, Andy was already determined to hate the record by the time he went home, and 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 made a point of telling everybody how much he hated the record <laughs> before it came out. <laughs> and then it turned out to be the most successful record they ever released. So, wow, it's amazing. Who would have been your contemporaries at that point in time? Well, this was late 1966, early 1967. What would be on the radio at that time? Well, uh, if you wanted to know what would be on the radio, you listen to my album Faithful, the first side, because what I tried to do on that was that record I did in 1976, 10 years after... I first got into the so-called music business and it was all covers. And I said, I want people to remember what it was like listening to the radio in 1966. There was Yardbirds, Happenings 10 Years Time Ago, Bob Dylan, Mostly You Go Your Way and I Go Mine, Rain, The Beatles, Good Vibrations, Beach Boys. I just did dead on covers of all those songs. If Six Was Nine, <laughs> Jimi Hendrix, you know, that was just like, to me, the golden age of radio what's happening in music is just more than anybody can keep up with and so suddenly the cuffs are off for djs they can play anything they want because nobody can figure it out anyway you know how it all goes together and suddenly radio was such an exciting thing to listen to because you'd hear like a rock maybe Beatles song then you'd hear judy collins after that then you might hear bill evans <laughs> after that they would just it was wide open you know it was just terrific it was the inception of what they called album-oriented radio when people started playing not the singles, but, you know, the cuts from the albums as well. That has all gone away, and with it, that sort of monolithic view of what audiences want to hear. And it's how I do research for records. I can't, you know, listen to radio. I'm afraid I'll hear something i don't want to hear <laughs> it'll get stuck in there so i so instead i go to youtube yeah you know i ask i'll ask one of my kids what should i listen to yeah and it'll give me maybe a couple of names and i'll go to youtube i'll look it up and then on the sidebar and then maybe i'll start clicking the sidebar and say oh who's that and so just by following these threads is how i learn about what's happening in music and there's a lot of music out there that you don't hear about unless you go looking for it. But that's different from an era when that music would never get made, when that music would never get recorded in the first place. So to me, this is in some sense is a golden age of music in that whatever you can imagine there is, it's out there. And if you it isn't out there and you can imagine how to make it, then you can put it out there. Yeah, the entry level is really low now. The bar fact, of entry. The entry level is freaking zero. Yeah. Put it that way. You <laughs> yeah. know, you can get for ninety nine cents an app on your phone yeah. that's got four tracks of recording on it, and another app that'll allow you to post it to wherever you want it, and another app that'll allow you to tell all your friends where it is and how to find it. Yeah, there's really no excuse if you want to get into the so called music business, do it. But in the end, you won't make any money until you go out and start playing it in front of people sometimes we'll hear something and it'll resonate with us and we won't know why do you know what i'm saying it's like sometimes like can't put your finger on why something's good yeah and, and, well it isn't even why it's good it's yeah. why it sticks yeah because sometimes it's something you want out of your head that's why i hit the mute button anytime i see taylor swift i'm gonna hit that mute button right now the same thing goes for like when Donald Trump comes on the TV, though. I don't want any of that in my head. I hit the mute button, you know. Do you like curate stuff that comes in? I kind of do. Oh, yeah. There are things that you latch on to if you think that you could learn something from it. Sometimes they are really illogical things. But every once in a while you hear a song and you realize that that was the perfect pop song. Have you always made music either a commercial thing or an art project. Do you know what I'm saying? Like when you're starting a project, you decide, okay, this one is for me and it's gonna be arty, or this one's gonna be, I'm gonna try to get something on the radio and I'm gonna go in that direction. 
Well, I don't. I tend to think that way when I'm producing for other people. I want to understand what their goals are so that I can try and guide things in that direction. And it isn't always necessarily commercial success. It's like when I did Grand Funk Railroad, they wanted critical acclaim, you know, because the critics just hated them. What stage were they at in their career when you came to work with them? Well, th- they were a jam band, you know, essentially a jam band. They were like, we're like cream, you know. We're a trio, bass, guitar, and drums, and we go out, and we have flimsy little song structures, and then we jam a lot, you know? And their albums were kind of the same way. They would just be kind of flabby, long songs, occasionally something, you know, concise and songwriterly. Their issue was that their manager, Terry Knight from Terry and the Pack, I don't know if you remember them, but that was one of these Michigan bands from the scene that produced Bob Seeger and Ted Nugent that produced Grand Funk Railroad as well but their manager was Terry Knight and he was great from the standpoint of you know hyping the bands everybody knew who Grand Funk Railroad was he bought the biggest billboard that had ever been purchased on Broadway in Times Square this was a big thing that only made their reputation more controversial because music critics said, what are they doing up there? You know, they're not the freaking Beatles, you know? <laughs> they're just a jam band. And they made the decision at a certain point to break away from Terry Knight. The other thing Terry Knight did was produce their records, and he was a terrible record producer. You know, this, they sounded bad, and he didn't editorialize anything. You know, he just let them jam away. So they had kind of the success and an audience and the one thing they didn't have was credibility that's one reason why they came to me because my reputation at that point was taking projects that had like for instance bad finger where like they were on their third try at making a record if it required me to just go in and completely take over the process, I would do that. But I figure I'm not going to be the third producer to fail to get an album out of Badfinger. So for better or worse, they got what they needed out of it. They got a record that had two hit singles off of it, and they got the success out of it. They fired me after the next record and never had another hit. So, And so the thing with Grand Funk was... We, you know, we need credibility somehow. We need somebody who knows how to make records to get involved in our next record. And they had everything all planned out beforehand. They had already written We're an American Band because they knew, okay, we need a single. And I helped them arrange it, you know, so that it sounded more singly. So it sounded less like a jam band, more like, you know, a single. Uh, They had hired a keyboard player, made their sound a little bit bigger and more well-rounded. But I remember he was very indignant about the fact that I made him do this. Dink, 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 dink. We're in a man. Dink, 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 dink. He said, wait a minute, I'm a keyboard. Anybody can do that, you know? That's as much uh, what makes it a hit record as anything. It's just that little dink, dink, dink coming in in the chorus, you know? When you heard the song for the first time, did you know that it had potential? I knew that it had potential, but I never depend on the market, you know. It's like you say, I know that's a single, but then so-and-so puts out a single the same week and everyone forgets about <laughs> your single. It's that kind of business. There's still a lot of chance. Even in those days, there was a lot of crooked stuff that went on. This was even before Clyde Davis got busted. You can't guarantee anything, but they were so confident about it. And then the label was totally behind the plan. So the very first thing we did is we went to Criterion Studios and we recorded We're an American Band, the track, the first day. We got all the sounds. The first day, we recorded the track. I don't mess around with the sounds all day long. Sound is the most subjective part of the process. People think when they hear a record for the first time that you intended for it to sound that way. And that's the only way that it possibly could have sounded. Of course, when you're making the record, you have all this range of possibilities and you can analyze it to death, you know, as has happened in some projects. But in any case, very early in the next day's session, we finished it and then went right into the mastering room because they had announced the release a week later. (laughs) A week after we went in to record the song, that was supposed to be the official release date of the song. And lo and behold, because of the way the industry was in those days, if you had enough radio ads and enough pre-orders on the single, you charted. A week later, the single comes out and it charts 
in the twenties. Wow. A week later, after wow. we a week after we recorded it, wow. you know, nobody's even heard it yet. Yeah, it didn't take that much longer f- for us to get the album done. than what well, you know, the album's you know a big giant hit now. That doesn't happen a whole lot, but it's just not the kind of thing that you can depend on. You know, I mean, there's a complete opposite end of the spectrum, which was meatloaf. The opposite of like that confidence and knowing what you're doing, you had to have a master plan, you know, to accomplish it. Meatloaf, on the other hand, was just a crapshoot through the entire thing. I'm even fascinated though we were- by that album because any time an anomaly breaks through, it's really interesting to me. Yeah, and that there's nothing else like that. Whatever that is, it's very unique. It's unlike other music going on at the time. Well, it was not completely unlike other music that was going on at the time, because when I went to see Meatloaf, I knew who Meatloaf was. I had seen him in the Rocky Horror Show. I knew who he was. I didn't know who Steinman was. Steinman, actually, the genius behind the whole thing. But they did a live audition for me. Steinman on the piano, Meatloaf and two background singers, and essentially did the entire record with piano accompaniment, but did all of the highlights of the record, acted out with everything, with the histrionics, paradise, and dashboard light, and all that stuff. And while I'm watching it, you know, and they're giving me the sob story, they said, no producer wants to touch this. The concept is too big. No producer really wanted to deal with it. And so they're doing this for me, and in my head, I'm thinking, this is a spoof of Bruce Springsteen. It's all the same, you know, Airsats 50s stuff, you know, with motorcycles, switchblades, leather jackets, all that Rebel Without a Cause iconography. And I'm thinking, this is a spoof of Bruce Springsteen, and that's how I'm going to approach it. Wow. And he had a label at the time. I wouldn't have taken it on unless he had a label. But the day before we went into the studio, and we had rehearsed the band for two weeks already, you know, we were ready to just go in there and do it live, which the record was mostly live, not the singing, but all the playing on it was mostly all live. Meatloaf says, I want to go off my label. They don't understand me. And he says, whatever. I said, well, I'm not your manager. I can't, you know, tell you what to do. But you know we're going into the studio tomorrow. And he says, well, I got to get off my label, you know. So I go to, uh, it was either Paul Fishkin or Albert Grossman, you know, who was running uh, Bearsville at the time. And I said, well, if you put this, you know, it's too late now. We're already rehearsed. We actually got members of Springsteen's band. We got Roy Bitten Amazing. and Max Weinberg Amazing. are in the band. You know, this is how much of a spoof it is to me. Yeah. And I say, well, put this on my tab, you know, underwrite the expenses like you would a regular record, and we'll give you right of first refusal on the record. We finish the record, and Bearsville turns it down, as does Warner Brothers, who's distributing Bearsville. And it takes six months to find somebody to take the record. They shop it around everybody, and everyone says, what is this? <laughs> you know, a spoof of Bruce Springsteen? And uh, finally, they find a, you know, a small subsidiary of Epic Records called Cleveland International. And they have one act on the label. Ian Hunter is the only act they have on the label. Great guy, a great player. I should call him for a collab. You were the first person I ever heard talk about the revolution in the way music is consumed maybe as far back as the late 70s to how it is today if you look back at the things that allowed you to understand what was possible were there any forks in the road where it went either a different way than you thought it was going to go or had a potential to do something better than it did i put out a thing called no world order it came out in the late 80s, and it came out in a number of different formats. And it was the first example, if you had the right device, of actual interactive music, music that you as a listener could get some control over. I came up with the concept through a number of things, but it was not driven at first by the technology. It was driven by the realization that, first of all, music is ultimately going to be repeated. That music is too limited a language that for us to be like completely original all the time, you know, so it's just bound to be repeated. The audience no longer is attached to a particular form of it. And there were two phenomena that caused me to realize that. One was 
Frankie goes to Hollywood. Relax. It didn't happen in this country. It never became like the giant hit in this country that it was, for instance, in England. But suddenly, you know, innovation had moved back to England and Europe and stuff at this particular point in the mid to late 80s. And they released a new version of Relax like every two weeks, a new remix of Relax every two weeks. And every one they released would go to the top of the charts. And I suddenly realized now the audience is accepting the mutability of music, that it doesn't have to be this way and that's sacred and, you know, it can't be any other way. Now that we realize this, how can we accelerate this process? How can we actually define it and make tools to do it and put them in people's hands? And that's when I came up with the idea of an album that didn't have a specific running order. And that was no world order. And it required a certain technology for it to be ultimately realized. But also it could be realized in non-interactive technologies, but in a number of ways. But I wrote the songs and with a certain discipline. There had to be a clean break every four to eight bars, or maybe every two bars. But there had to be clean breaks in the music everywhere, you know. So there are not a lot of songs with like syncopation, with a lot of upbeats, you know, a lot of it's got lots of downbeats and stuff like that. And then essentially record it like you usually would, but in the compositional part, you make sure you've got these breaks. Then come up with a technology by which you can string them together in real time. And found Philips CDI had just come out and the technology was in it to enable to do that. So I got together with a programmer that I was working with and we came up with the No World Order concept, the whole engine that ran it, that allowed people to essentially go in and specify how they'd like to experience the music. And even like stop and loop on one piece of the music and change the parameters in that one piece of music. So say, I never did understand what the words were there. Let's take out some of the instruments. And so it allowed you to, you know, experience it in that way. It allowed you to utilize it or filter it so that, let's say you want to use it for your aerobics. You set it so it never goes below a certain tempo. As you asked me about the fork in the road. Yes. After I did this, I got approached by a Time Warner Cable Network, which was doing an interactive TV experiment in Orlando, Florida, in a neighborhood. But they had fiber optic to the curb in the entire optic neighborhood, which is not unusual anymore, but in those days, big deal. And the neighborhood had a prototype set-top box that was supposed to be an interactive box. And since they were still prototyping the box, everyone got an SGI Indigo computer. And if you're not into computer graphs, you may not know what that is, but it's about the size of a carry-on suitcase. And they're trying to figure out, okay, what kind of services do people want? Pre-internet. This is pre-internet. No, people don't have internet in their homes yet. So they figure, okay, we'll develop a pizza pie application. You know, you can go on your television, pick out your toppings, you know, and a pizza will be delivered with your toppings. But they had reasonable query. What kind of interactive music services would people like in their homes? So they hired me to come up with a prototype so that they could make it part of this experiment. So we came up with a with an outline for it and a possible technological solution for it. But of course, you can't do it unless you got some music on servers. So we went to what was then the five majors. So we set up meetings with all the special products divisions of the labels. And we went in to say, we're just experimenting here. We want to see what kind of demand there is. So what you got to do is you got to put some music that people would be interested in, some name artist or something like that, some artists of some kind, and put their music on a server so that we can connect to it and deliver it to this particular audience, this experimental audience. Not a single label would hear of it. They say, we, we, no, we don't even, don't, la, 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 you know, don't, don't talk about this. Two years later, Napster. <laughs> later. So I had gone in with the hope that somehow the labels would see the light and ease everything into this new area instead of it just collapsing into chaos, which is essentially what it's done. And they're only now figuring out how do we recover from this? What is the role of the record label now in all of this, given that artists can do everything themselves? The thing that surprised me about the streaming revolution when it happened, I was really excited about it. And I I just imagined as a 
real f- fanatical fan of music and you know going to a record store every day and walking around the record stores and just wanting to hear everything the idea of living in the record store where everything was always available on demand when you want it seemed like just the greatest thing that could ever happen and i thought i would want to dj all day and what i've come to learn now that it's here is that actually i really like being dj'd too and i spend much more time listening to curated music Mm -hmm. than picking what I want to listen to. I like the surprise of what comes next. You already know what you want to listen to. Yeah. So things that you didn't know were there that you didn't know you wanted to listen to, you know? And yeah, those are the things that I try and find if I'm doing any research for where to move my own music. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for doing this. Oh, we're all done? Okay. Cool. Thanks to Todd Rundgren for chatting with Rick about his past and present work. You can check out his new song with Sparks called Your Fandango, along with all of our favorite Rundgren songs at brokenrecordpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Ben Tolliday, Eric Sandler, and Jennifer Sanchez. With engineering help from Nick Chafee. Our executive producer is Mia LaBelle. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like this show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond.